Tiberius, the second emperor of Rome. He went through many changes of fortune in his life. He was the stepson of Augustus, however, never the preferred heir for the imperial throne. Born 43 BC into a very well distinguished noble family in Rome, the Claudii. Throughout his life, he was granted many privileges by his stepfather Augustus. He accompanied him during his peace talk with the Parthians, where Augustus was able to recover the lost standards that were lost during the Battle of Carrhae by Crassus. Tiberius proved to be a very able commander himself and served with distinction in the northern frontier, and he was well liked by the soldiers. After his unsuccessful marriage with Augustus' daughter, Julia, he went into more or less self-inflicted exile on Rhodes for eight years, to Augustus' great annoyance. In 2 AD, he returned to Rome, not to the favor of Augustus, who forbade him from entering public life. But two years later, however, Gaius and Lucius, the sons of Julia and Marcus Agrippa, the current favorite heirs of Augustus, both died. Augustus therefore, with reluctance, once again turned to Tiberius, who now was the first in line to succession. Tiberius was made tribune of the people and was given imperium, and was adopted by Augustus. Although Tiberius already had a son, Drusus, not together with Julia, Augustus compelled Tiberius to adopt Germanicus, who was the son of Tiberius' late brother. It would be another ten years until Tiberius ascended to the imperial throne. During this time, Tiberius distinguished himself in the army. He crushed revolts in Illyricum and Pannonia, and saved the situation on the northern frontier after the Varius disaster in Tudibur Forest. The Battle of Tudibur Forest In 9 AD, Varus, a Roman commander, who was in great standing at the imperial court, was in command of the newly subdued province of Germania. Varus had previously some success governing provinces in Africa, Syria and Judea, so it was believed that he would be more than capable of handling the situation in Germania. One of Varius' advisors was Arminius, who was a native German, who was brought to Rome as a young boy to keep his chieftain father in line. Arminius made a military career in Rome and became a cavalry officer. No doubt, Varius valued Arminius' advice in governing the lands of his former people. In the summer 9 AD, Varus was led in an ambush deep in the Germanic forest of Tudeborg by Arminius. For three days, the Romans were ambushed by a large coalition of Germanic tribes. Some 20,000 Romans died, three legions, six auxiliary cohorts and three cavalry allies as well as the camp followers were slaughtered. Tiberius was sent with two legions and was able to reinforce the Rhine frontier and prevent the German coalition from entering Gaul. Tiberius was overlooked in the imperial succession time and time again despite his abilities in diplomacy, administration as well as in military matters. So why is that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First, he was not a blood relative to Augustus. He was the son of Augustus' wife from a prior marriage and, according to Augustus, was not well suited personality-wise for the task. He was silent, reserved and appeared to be suspicious and severe to many. He was part of the Claudii family who was known for their pride and Tiberius shared that trait as well and having been scorned by Augustus on the succession time and time again that would have led to some resentment in, in Tiberius. On the 19th of August, 14 AD, Augustus died. One month later, the Senate had a meeting. Augustus was deified and it was suggested that Tiberius would be granted the same status and powers as Augustus had. At first, Tiberius declined the offer. It is unknown exactly why. Some of the ancient sources claim that he just feigned reluctance, same as Augustus had displayed when he first ascended to the office. But we can't rule out that Tiberius' hesitation was genuine. He was 55 years old and accepting meant many more years of public life. He had already displayed reluctance before when he went on his own exile in Rhodes. Either way, he did, however, eventually accept. Augustus had prepared for a smooth transition of power by sending out letters to the provincial governors and the military commanders right before his death. Two minor mutinies broke out around this time, although not due to Tiberius or the succession, one in Pannonia and the other along the Rhine frontier. Tiberius dispatched his own son Drusus to take care of the Pannonian rebels while Tiberius' adopted son, Germanicus, was governor of Gaul, so he took care of the mutiny on the Rhine. 
Germanicus was an honorary name given to his father for his many successes in Germania. Germanicus, perhaps thinking that a military campaign against the Germans would keep the morale high in the army. So he led his army across the Rhine. He helped many Roman-friendly tribes and fought some skirmishes. He went to the Burg Forest and buried the Roman soldiers. These campaigns were not sanctioned by Tiberius, and at first it seems Tiberius didn't mind Germanicus taking matters into his own hands, but when Germanicus failed to create conditions which would have enabled him to remain in Germania throughout the year, Tiberius recalled him. Some see this as Tiberius being jealous of Germanicus' success in Germany, but the prior emperor Augustus had decided that the empire needed to consolidate and not expand further, so Tiberius just followed the line set by Augustus. And remember, Germanicus' campaign was not sanctioned by Tiberius. However, Germanicus had restored Roman prestige in the area after the Varus disaster and strengthened the northern frontier. It's probably the reason why Tiberius allowed the campaign to go on even though it was not sanctioned. Germanicus was able to recover two eagles, the battle standards of the legions that were lost in Tiberburg Forest, and for that was granted a great triumph when he returned to Rome, 17 AD. He was also granted one of the consulships for the following year, 18 AD, together with Tiberius. Armenia during this time was a buffer state between the Parthian Empire and Rome, and it led to, as we will see, many wars between the two powers. When the Parthian expelled the Roman nominee to the Armenian throne, Germanicus was dispatched to the east to take care of the problem, but it seems that Tiberius didn't trust his hot-headed nephew so he also sent out the new governor of the province of Syria, Cornelius Piso, to keep an eye on him and prevent another war with Parthia. In the east, Germanicus incorporated two former client states of Rome into the empire's fold, both located in Anatolia. He also installed a new king in Armenia. Then he went on to Egypt, but Egypt was the personal province of the emperor, and no one was allowed to enter the province without his express permission, something Germanicus didn't have. He did, however, relieve a famine in Alexandria by opening some of the Roman storages. When Germanicus returned to Syria, he found that Piso had tried to cancel some of his arrangements in Anatolia. And soon after Piso left Syria, Germanicus fell ill and died. Germanicus strongly believed that Piso had poisoned him. He even sent him a letter before he died, cancelling their friendship. Piso soon returned to Syria, but was forced to leave by the legate. He was not allowed to re-enter the province after he had relinquished control of the province. Germanicus' wife, Agrippina, took the ashes of her dead husband to Rome, where she was met with a great procession of people wanting to say goodbye to their hero. Germanicus was adored by the people who loved him, and they saw him as a national hero. When Piso returned to Rome, he was put on trial for the murder of Germanicus and for re-entering his province of Syria after relinquishing command. He was not convicted for the murder of Germanicus, but committed suicide since he knew he would be found guilty for re-entering Syria. However, the rumors in Rome said that not only did Piso murder Germanicus, he did so at the order of Tiberius, and Tiberius had forced him to kill himself in prison, apparently because Tiberius wanted his own son Drusus to succeed him, and Germanicus was growing too popular and he often acted without sanction from Tiberius. If the rumors are true or not, we don't know. Either way, this diminished Tiberius' reputation, for the people in Rome believed he did. Tiberius' own son, Drusus, was now the undisputed heir apparent. Agrippina, Germanicus' wife, entered into a feud with Tiberius for the death of her husband. Agrippina was the daughter of Marcus Agrippa and Julia, Augustus' daughter. Agrippina and Germanicus had six children, one of them a boy, named Gaius Caesar, named after his famous relative Gaius Julius Caesar. He would, however, get the nickname Caligula. Augustus had established the Praetorian Guard as a personal bodyguard for himself. The current prefect of the guard was a man called Sejanus, who had befriended Tiberius. Sejanus' influence increased when he was allowed to move the guard inside the city. The Praetorian Guard was the only ones allowed to carry weapons inside the Pomerium, the sacred city line. However, Tiberius' son, Drusus, and Sejanus did not get along, 
It is said that Drusus on one occasion struck Sejanus right in the face. Sejanus had seduced Drusus' wife, Livilia. When Drusus died suddenly, it was suspected that she, his wife, poisoned him by the order of Sejanus. Tiberius, however, didn't suspect any foul play yet. Sejanus' influence over Tiberius grew steadily, and he began to secure succession for himself. Now that Drusus was out of the way, Sejanus plotted against Agrippina, the widow of Germanicus, and her friends and children. He made Tiberius banish Agrippina and one of her sons, and another son was forced into a prison in Rome, where he starved to death. Everyone in line of succession was getting removed one by one. Sejanus was clearing a path for himself. He convinced Tiberius to move to Capri, a small island off the coast of Naples. The emperor was then 67 years old, perhaps glad to be able to semi-retire, and left matters in Rome to his friend Sejanus. In 29 AD, Tiberius' mother and Augustus' wife, Livia, died. She was 86 years old. She had some influence over Tiberius, and with her passing, Sejanus' influence would have strengthened even further. Two years later, 31 AD, Sejanus and Tiberius were co-consuls. Even though Tiberius was still on Capri, and Sejanus was allowed to marry someone in the imperial family, presumably Livilia, Drusus' widow. Sejanus was at this point the de facto ruler in Rome and was expected to be proclaimed heir any day, but this was just a ploy to make Sejanus feel safe, for Tiberius had received a letter from Antonia, Germanicus' mother, that would raise his suspicion of Sejanus. He now moved to get rid of Sejanus. Tiberius summoned Gaius Caesar, the only surviving son of Germanicus and Agrippina, to Capri to keep him safe from Sejanus. On October the 18th, Sejanus was summoned to the Senate to hear a dispatch from Tiberius. Sejanus probably hoped he would be announced as the heir. However, he would be disappointed. He was branded a traitor and was strangled to death. Tiberius was disillusioned when he realized that his friend had betrayed him, and this was no recent development. Sejanus' widow sent a letter to Tiberius revealing that Sejanus had seduced Livilia and had her poisoned Drusus, Tiberius' own son. Tiberius would grow more suspicious and very rarely leave the safety of Capri. He never entered Rome again. Anyone connected to Sejanus was murdered in the streets of Rome, and Tiberius built a big spy network to keep an eye on any would-be conspirators. Tiberius was getting older, and the question of succession was getting increasingly urgent. He had three candidates. His grandson, Drusus' son, Camellus, Gaius Caesar, Germanicus' son and his nephew Claudius. Camellus was considered too young, and Claudius was considered too foolish. Thus he made Gamellus and Gaius joint heir. Gaius was the more popular pick with his closer connection to the Iulii family and his father Germanicus. In 33 AD, Gaius held the quaestorship, a lesser office in Rome, but Tiberius did nothing to prepare Gaius for greater responsibility. Tiberius died 16th of March 37 AD. He was 77 years old. The news of his death was met with joy and relief in Rome. Tiberius is very disliked by our surviving sources and I think most of that stems from his last couple of years on the throne. He ruled from Capri and monitored events in Rome with his vast spy network. Anyone criticizing him was seen as a potential conspirator who he could get rid of. Malicious rumors in Rome depict Tiberius' life on Capri, that he passed his time with debauchery and torturing people for the slightest annoyance. It is however worth noting that the empire enjoyed, for the most part, peace and increased prosperity during the reign of Tiberius. My personal take on Tiberius is that he was a man already disillusioned with the Principate before even taking the throne. He had been around Augustus all his life, and was always seen as the last resort for Augustus' inheritance which would have made him embittered, and when he eventually proclaimed him heir, it would have been bittersweet. If you are to believe all the tortures and cruelties that our ancient sources ascribe to Tiberius, it's nothing to what is to come. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at Tiberius' successor, Gaius Caesar, better known as Caligula. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for watching the video. Don't forget to check the description where I've put some uh, suggested reading if you're more interested in 
uh, Tiberius and his life. And next time we'll check in out his successor, Caligula or Gaius Caesar. And remember, I'm planning to do a video like this for every single Roman emperor. So be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss any of them. So yeah, I will see you in the next video.